Well, we're really thankful to be able to hear from some of our healthcare workers and uh, just want you to know how proud we are of you and we pray for you. Our elders are praying for you. Uh, our whole church is uh, behind you. We're so thankful for all that you're doing and uh, we're grateful for opportunities like this. We can just update our church family on uh, what's going on out there in the world. Uh, you know, um, this week with even difficult news coming in from around the world and even in Illinois, uh, I was so thankful that uh, two of our families, two leaders in our church, they both gave birth to little babies and got to uh, welcome them into the world. Uh, you know, uh, for me, I work so hard, you parents know, to try to get your kids to like me. And so I don't know what this is going to do when we all get back together. You know, they're going to forget who we are. Uh, but so just maybe flash a picture every once in a while so they don't forget who we are. But, you know, when a baby enters the the world and comes into a family, right away, they are part of the family. Uh, we have three children. All three of them were born, and then uh, they didn't need to have a waiting period to join the family. They were just in right away. They didn't have to uh, pay anything to be a part of the family. They were, just, they were just in. And as we think about even what's going on now in the world, my oldest son, he was up in Milwaukee at college, and then when uh, the quarantine started to come in place, he came home. He's living in our basement. He's doing classes virtually online, and uh, we're not charging him anything because he's a part of the family. He's with us. And as we think about uh, what's gone on even in the last week as we celebrated uh, the resurrection of Christ on Easter, we remembered his death on Good Friday, as we think about those things that happened in our world 2,000 years ago, the incredible truth is that at that moment when Jesus rose from the grave, he set into motion the birth of of the church, and we became part of the family of God. And uh, we know that uh, several days later, probably about 50 days, the church calendar will say that in uh, history, that uh, Pentecost happened. And when Pentecost happens, that is the actual birth of the church. But all people who call Jesus Lord, any church that submits to Christ is a part of that family. And you and I are a part of that family. And as we're a part of that family, we have certain privileges that come our way. We get certain power that comes our way because we're a part of that family. And so uh, this weekend, I want to uh, continue um, in the same text that we were in last weekend. You know, as I was studying it, I looked ahead a little bit, and I thought that this message that we're in in uh, John chapter 20 would be uh, really appropriate for the times that we're in right now. And so I'm going to continue in John chapter 20. Last week, we were in John 20, verses 1 through 18. Uh, we saw Mary Magdalene, and she was uh, there at the tomb, and she came and announced all that she'd seen and heard to the disciples, as Jesus had instructed her to do. And then uh, we uh, pick it up here in John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. And as we think about uh, the... Um, a series of events that have happened, just think what a week would do in the lives of these disciples. Just a week earlier, they were having joy as uh, Jesus was coming into uh, Jerusalem and they were shouting Hosanna and then their whole world is tossed upside down. Thursday was a pretty good day. Friday was a very difficult day where he was um, crucified. And then Saturday, what would Saturday have been like? It would have been one of the worst days of their lives. I imagine the disciples as they're there on Saturday thinking about Jesus and the brutal way that he was killed, wondering, why did we leave everything for him? We thought he was going to be here forever. And, you know, probably talking to one another, saying, did you see his wounds on his back and how they beat him? And he was killed so brutally. This isn't what we expected. And I imagine Saturday to be a day filled with uh, fear and with anger and with sadness and a lot of tears. And they're probably there trying to comfort one another because they've abandoned everything else. A week earlier, they were so proud to be following Jesus because he was being celebrated. But then now they're in fear. and They're locked up in the context of the story that we're in right here. And so the lives of the disciples would have been one of uh, a lot of distress on Saturday and on Sunday until Jesus shows up. And so this week for me, I uh, just being honest with you also, you know, not every week is a great week. And I've uh, tried very hard to stay optimistic and positive about all of this throughout it all. But this week, you know, it kind of hit me in a wave. How much longer is this going to be? 
And I really want to get out and see some of my friends and just do normal things. And so I know that some of you are also feeling that. I talked to some of you this week, and you also mentioned that this week was difficult for you. And so as we think about that in our own lives, some of us are in places of fear once again. And we want to be reminded from the scripture that Jesus Christ, he rose, we celebrated that last week, but he is still alive today. And so the title of the message today is The Power of the Resurrection. The Power of the Resurrection. You could turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20. John 20. Let me pray as we open up the word of God right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be in the word. Lord, these are words that were breathed out by you and they're instructive to us and they comfort our hearts, Lord. And I thank you, God, that you have risen from the grave and that you've given us resurrection power in our own bodies as well as we thought about that last week. And I ask, God, that you would speak uh, through your word today to us. We are open, Lord. We're receptive. Our ears are open, ready to hear, and our hearts are uh, willing, Lord, to, to change. And so please now speak, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The power of the resurrection, starting in John chapter 20, verse 19, it says this. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. For those of you who want to experience resurrection power, the a power that's given to Jesus' family, we can see some principles right here in the text for your own life. So uh, let's first notice this. What well, we have in the power of the resurrection, a new peace to overcome my fear. A new peace to overcome my fear. Notice here, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week. So this is Sunday night. Uh, this is the third day. Jesus was crucified on Friday. Saturday, he was in the tomb. Sunday, on the third day, he rose. Uh, in the morning, he was with, uh, he appeared to Mary. And then Peter and John, they went there and showed up at the grave, at the tomb. And then now, here they are. They're locked up. On the third day, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, here it is, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the, do, the Jews. So the doors are locked. It's an interesting detail that uh, John is putting here. You only lock the doors when you're afraid. You lock the doors because you want to keep some people out, and so they are locked up in fear because they are afraid of the Jews. They had already had Jesus killed, and now they wonder what's going to happen to them. And so they are locked up and they're in fear. Then Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. It doesn't say that the door even opened, right? The doors are locked. And so he just shows up and he, there he is standing in their presence. And he says, Peace be with you. Because he knows that they have fear over what has transpired. But also probably a bit of fear because now somebody just showed up in the room. Hey, we locked the door. How is there somebody standing in our presence right now? And so he says, peace be with you. Jesus Christ, he wants to overcome your fear with peace this day. He doesn't beat them up. Notice that, right? He doesn't uh, say, why are you afraid? And why are you sitting over here locked up in a room? He just comes to them, shows up and says, peace be with you, because Jesus understands that the world that we're in will cause some people fear and anguish and pain. And so he comes with the spirit of gentleness, and he says, peace be with you, a new peace to overcome my fear. That's what we get. And he wants to replace your fear today with peace. Verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. The disciples aren't comforted first by Jesus' presence because they don't know who it is that stepped up into the room, just like Mary didn't recognize him because this is beyond their expectations. Even though Jesus had talked about it, they still don't get it. And then here he is now in their midst. But until, until it says he showed them his hands and his side, it was in the marks it was in the scars that Jesus had that the disciples had their eyes open and they saw the Lord, right? They're scared. Imagine what it would have been like 
someone you love dying two days earlier, and then now they're appearing right before you. And maybe the thoughts, just like it said that John started to realize the things earlier that he had been told, that Jesus had said, all of this is starting to dawn on the disciples, that Jesus is indeed alive. It was in seeing the scars that they realized. And in times of fear, Jesus wants to bring you peace. This is a great gift that God has for you in the midst of your peace, in the midst of your fear. And I have uh, taken a bit of a break from checking out the news these days because in the news there's so much negative things that are out there. Now I go online and I look at specific articles that I want to see just because I want to be updated. And I may watch just a little bit of what's going on, but it's been very difficult to watch all of it all the time. And what happens to us as we start to see the things that are going on in the world is we start to get fearful because there are some things that are outside of our control. And when there are things that are outside of our control, we end up fearing. And when the control is gone because we don't know what's going to happen with our workplace, we don't know what's going to happen now with money, and then when the control is gone, we start to fear. And so Jesus, he is speaking very specifically to them as they're in that upper room they're locked up in fear and he wants them to have peace and I want you to have peace even in the difficult times I got a friend who works in the hospital he's told me that their respirators they only have a few left and they're starting to have to make decisions about who is going to get a respirator and when you hear something like that, it could cause you to fear because you don't have control over those things. I don't have control over those things. And so when we're out of control, we end up in fear. And so as you start to experience things out in the world that are out of your control, the disciples, they didn't have control over Jesus, what was going to happen to him. If it was up to them, he would have lived. He would have never died, but it was out of their control. And so as things are out of your control, you just need to realize that, hey, there's a thought coming to my mind. Something's out of control. It's causing me some fear. I got some anxiousness. My heart rate is starting to elevate a little bit. And you take that thought captive and you just say to the Lord, there's a fear coming over my heart because there's something out of my control. God, I need your peace right now. And you ask God for peace. See, because there's a lot of things you're not going to control. And if you keep on thinking about all the things you can't control, when is this going to stop? Will there be a vaccine? Will they have enough respirators? We start to worry because we don't know and they're out of our control. And if you just focus on all of those things, you are going to spiral and it's not going to end well. And Jesus, he comes to them on the third day and with so much grace, he says, peace be upon you. Peace be with you in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your grief. And so I want you to instead, when you have these things that are outside your control, maybe you can start to think about things that you have control over, don't you? You have control over if you put your face in the Word of God. You have control over whether or not you're going to spend some time and pray and sit and talk to the Lord. I had that experience this week, even in a difficult time. I sat down. Susan was in our living room, and she was doing some work in the morning. And I went down, and I had my Bible, and I wasn't doing my uh, sermon prep. I just was looking at some other portions of Scripture. And I sat there and I had the Bible open and I just let the Lord minister to me. I have some control over this. I have some control over the time that I'm going to spend with the Lord. You have control over uh, spending time with other people, don't you? You have control over reaching out when you're in need and asking for some help and for some prayer. And you have some control over some things. And so in your moments of fear, go to the places, the things that you can actually control. And let's see if you can get to better places. And these are the things that bring us peace. And Jesus steps into the room and immediately upon seeing them, their fear is replaced with peace because now they see the fulfillment of it all. The power of the resurrection brings peace to those who fear. Let's continue here, verse 21. It says this, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. 
If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Let's see the next thought here about the power of the resurrection. A new creation to participate in Jesus' ministry. You literally become a new creation to participate in Jesus' ministry. This is one of the powers of the resurrection. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Jesus says, Peace be with you again. It's almost like, now that I got your attention, you know, I said peace be with you, but you were a little bit shocked because I just appeared in the room. Because it was like a magic trick and I just showed up and that took you off guard a little bit. But here I am, now that I got your attention, peace be with you. Let me just repeat it. It's a double emphasis. It's very important. Jesus wants to be very clear that he is trying to give peace to those that are in sorrow or in fear or locked up. And he wants to give it to you. Now that I have your attention, in the same way that the disciples see in the hands and side of Jesus Christ the marks that show the great love that God has for him, They can see that the marks are still there and they show the sacrificial nature of God. They see the characteristics of God that remind them and when they see the marks, when they see what's gone on, they are glad and they rejoice. And then, as we continue here, Jesus, he says, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you out. And the disciples are going to be used in some incredible ways that they don't even know. It is going to Beyond, be beyond what they could even imagine the way that they're going to be used and the fruitfulness that they're going to have in the world. And they're going to participate to extend the ministry of Jesus Christ all over the world. And this isn't a simple commitment. It's not a haphazard statement that somebody makes. It's not a broken promise. This is Jesus Christ saying, I am going to send you out in the world in the same way that God the Father has sent me. And so just think about that for a moment. The way that God has sent Jesus into the world, he is going to send them into the world. And so he is giving peace, but he's also making them a new creation to participate in the ministry that Jesus has. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Just think of how Jesus was sent. He was sent with a relationship with God the Father, and he talked to him regularly. You also have are being sent, and you have a relationship with God the Father. In the same way Jesus did, you have a relationship with Jesus and with God and with the Holy Spirit. And so in the same way God has sent Jesus, he is sending you into the world. That's what he tells the disciples. And when he had said this, is incredible here, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't like Pentecost. Pentecost is coming up, uh, the church calendar would say, about 50 days later. So Jesus is with them for some time, and then he ascends to the Father, and then the day of Pentecost comes. That's when the Holy Spirit comes upon the crowds, the apostles, and the believers that were there. And that would be the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit comes upon these disciples at this moment. Receive the Holy Spirit. And the word for breathed here, breathed, is emphasao. Emphasao. It's a beautiful word, only used one time right here in the Gospel of John. This idea of, in the New Testament, it's only used this time. This idea of breathed. Just think about that. The breath of God. The breath of God giving life. The breath of God allowing them to receive the Holy Spirit. They are becoming a new creation right here. Can you picture it? Can you picture the breath of God going over a group of people to bring life? In the Old Testament, there are a few examples that I want to show you. And I want you to see the power of the breath of God in the scriptures. The first idea first uh, thought here comes from Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. Genesis 2 7 says this when God created man. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Formed man out of the dust breathed into his nostrils and he became alive. Can you picture the breath of God going out over that pile of dust that was formed into a man and he breathed in the nostrils and then the man would have been like, and he became alive. That's the power of the breath of God. 
out of dust he can make living things. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 5. There's this vision that Ezekiel has of this valley of dry bones there. And it says this, Thus says the Lord God to these bones, these dead bones. Just picture all these bones scattered around in an area there. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. When the breath of God flows over a place, the only thing that can happen is life comes to it. And this is what happens to the disciples there. They are fearful. They're locked up. They're afraid. They don't know what's going to happen. And then Jesus comes into the room and he breathes on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. And they are transformed. They are changed. They become alive like Adam became alive. Like those dry bones became alive. These disciples now, as they receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, they become alive. And just like that valley of dry bones, just like that dust that was formed into the man, Jesus wants to breathe life into you also. He wants to transform you from death to life. He wants to make you alive so that you have a purpose, that you have something to do, that you can do something that's not just to fulfill yourself, but to fulfill God himself. And this is what he calls the disciples to, to participate in his ministry, and he makes them new creations. It is a beautiful thing when the breath of God comes over a person. When the breath of God comes over a land, revival happens. And Jesus is breathing, and Jesus is even breathing now. Even in the midst of all that we see in the world, he is breathing, and he is active, and he is not worried. This is Jesus Christ, and he is saying, peace be unto you. All of you listening to my voice right now, if fear has got you locked up, if the current situation has got you worried or upset, Jesus wants to breathe new life into you and he will make you a new creation. Just picture those disciples locked up in that, their room. No faith, no hope. And then Jesus comes, their faith is renewed and they are restored to life. Verse 23 He goes on to say, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now with the Holy Spirit, they're included in the plan of God to offer forgiveness to the world. Now we know that uh, forgiveness is only given and granted by Jesus Christ, by God the Father himself. That's why when Jesus came... And he started to forgive sins. He would say to the paralytic, you know, take up your mat, you know. And then he would say, what's easier? Take up your mat or say your sins are forgiven. And then he would forgive the person of sins. They would say, this is blasphemy because only God can forgive sins. So we know that. That is true. You and I aren't able to forgive sins in that way against God. You know, we don't need to have a mediator between us and God other than Jesus Christ. He's the one who's offered the forgiveness. So you and I can't do that. And so when he says that he has given us the ability here to forgive sins, he's not saying that we now have the authority, the power to forgive sins like he does. Only God can forgive sins. But he's saying you now can enter into this part of the ministry. You can participate with me in what I am doing as I give to people forgiveness of sins. And you can also participate in this. You have an opportunity, church, The disciples had it. You do also to share the gospel and anybody that receives this forgiveness, anybody that hears and responds, they also will be forgiven. It's the same thing that Jesus did and now he's saying to the disciples, you also have that ability and it's been given to you because now you can participate in the ministry of Jesus Christ. It is passed on to the disciples and it is passed on to you as well. You're a new creation. The power of the resurrection gives you this new life. And with this new life, you participate in the very work of God of offering forgiveness to people, of reminding them that there's a God who loves them, a God who died on a cross for them. And we get to participate in this glorious ministry that Jesus Christ came here to do. You are a new creation. And the power of the resurrection gives you a new life, a new life to participate in the work of God. So are you 
living like a person with new life? Or are you characterized more like the valley of dry bones? Are you a person who has the breath of God inside of you that is giving you life? Or are you more like the pile of dirt before God breathed into the nostrils of man? We are called, church, we are called to keep on doing the work of ministry, pandemic or not, fear or not, persecution or not. And this is the ministry that Jesus started and it continues to this day. The work of Christ doesn't stop in a pandemic. And during this uh, pandemic, we've been trying to figure out ways that we can support you. We've had this food drive. We're going to continue it on for another week. And we're trying to get more resources and more food so we can help to bless people. Well, we got, I got an email uh, this week or a Facebook message from uh, Pastor Timothy in Nepal, one of the churches that were planted. Um, he has a s- series of house churches up in Nepal in the mountains there. And he had said that they are running low on food and that they were struggling and just said to pray. And so we had just received this benevolence offering here, and so we had a little bit of resources. And so we were able to bless the church in Nepal. And he was able to go up into some of these villages and start to hand out some food. And this is because you were generous, because you continued to be faithful. And I just want to encourage you with something that he says here. He wrote a thank you note and uh, wanted to just offer his thanks to all of us, to the church. And in his thank you note to our church, he said this, God is bringing change in bigger ways for our brothers and sisters from hunger. When God gets a hold of you, like Pastor Timothy there in Nepal, like many of you hearing my voice right now, the work never stops. Of course, we take times of rest and seasons of maybe rethinking what we're going to be doing. But we don't stop in fear. We keep on going because the very breath of God has breathed life into us. And when God gets a hold of you, when God's breath is in you, you will do remarkable things like the disciples went on to do. They're making even bigger changes in these difficult times because the Spirit of God is in them. There's power in the resurrection of Christ. He gives it to his followers. Peace. He makes you a new creation to participate in his ministry. So much grace for you in in our time of need. Let's continue. Verse 24, it says this. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them. When Jesus came, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in the hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Next, notice what the resurrection of Christ gives to us. A new faith to defeat my doubt. A new faith to defeat my doubt. It says here clearly that Thomas wasn't with them in this first instance with Jesus coming to them. Out of all of the 11 remaining disciples, Judas had killed himself. Thomas, out of the 11 remaining, was the only person who wasn't there to see it. It doesn't say where he was. It just says that he is gone. Now, this passage is where we get the phrase that's kind of common out there in the world called doubting Thomas. Maybe you've heard this before. Uh, commonly used expression out in the world, oh, you're such a doubting Thomas. You know, well, why do you doubt? Just not being a doubting Thomas. Maybe you heard that before. It's very common. Two of the most famous disciples that people would know out there in the world, Thomas because of his doubt and Judas because of his betrayal. And so here's the passage that we see 
Thomas doubting. Now his friends have just been revived. They are alive. All of their faiths were dead. It was hung on a cross and buried in a tomb. And now his friends are alive and they're excited about being alive. They have purpose again to their life. But poor Thomas, he missed out on it. And it could have been any of them. And sometimes I see people get so discouraged because they are missing out on maybe the spiritual experience that somebody else had. I just want to tell you that this is true back then, and it's true today, that you cannot live off of the faith experience of another person. You can't live off the faith experience and revival of your parents or your brother or your sister or your roommate. Every person needs to come to faith in Christ and be revived themselves. And so here we see Thomas, and he wasn't there the first time. He missed out on it. So the disciples, verse 25, (coughs) excuse me. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. He needs proof before he believes. The others have seen it, but Thomas has not. Some people go through their whole life with this attitude, I will never believe. I'm never going to believe. That's what Thomas says. That's a long time, right? Really? Never? There's nothing that you could see here that would cause you to believe. Some people feel that way. And Thomas is saying he will never believe. He's sad. He has his doubts. I understand it. He was left out. If you've ever been with a group of friends who are bonding over something, you know, they're uh, spending time, they went on a retreat or whatever, they may have a lot of inside jokes, you know, things that they talk about and laugh about. And so here's Thomas. He was out. I don't know. He was like in the marketplace, whatever he was doing. He comes back. All of his life was like, you're not going to believe what happened. You know, and they tell him about what Jesus did, and he wasn't there to experience it. And so now, you know, here they are, and they're talking about things. It'd be like, um, you know, could you believe when Jesus breathed on us? And like Tom, Thomas has no idea what he's talking about. You know, oh, man, I, I thought that Matthew was going to pass out when Jesus breathed. You know, like he has no idea what's happening. He can't understand it because he's missed out on it. And I just want you to think for a moment about these disciples and what they were like See, he needs proof, but his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were something special here because look, verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Eight days later. What an eight day period for Thomas. Yeah, sure, you saw him. Well, where is he? How come I'm not seeing him right now? Eight days later, locked up, and Jesus comes in the same way and stands and says, Peace be with you. Eight days, and the disciples were still together, and Thomas is with them. Eight days later, faith is back alive. They're excited, and there's Thomas, still no experience. The important thing I want you to see here is that Thomas is able to stay with these disciples during this time, even though they now have received the Holy Spirit, the breath of God has been on them, not Thomas, and they're still tolerable people. I think that's a really good lesson for us, those of us that are revived, those of us that are maybe on fire for the Lord, that others who are not there yet should never feel like, well, I can't be around that person because it's so irritating to me. Thomas, he is still with them eight days later. That's a really interesting detail that John writes and shares with us. What kind of a disciple are you? Are you self-righteous because you've had some experience so that people who are outside who don't haven't had it yet, they don't want anything to do with you? Or are you like these disciples who, having been revived, having been made alive, having experienced the breath of God, they are still there and Thomas is still able to be with them? These are loving brothers and they love him. And so, They're compassionate towards him. It goes on to say, Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. The doors are still locked. They're still afraid. And Jesus appears the same way. Peace be with you, just like before. Verse 27. 
Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. He gives the proof that Thomas had wanted. He knows what is in Thomas's heart, and he says, Do not disbelieve, but believe. Believe, Thomas. I'm going to give you the proof that you wanted. I'm going to give you an experience right now, Thomas. Go ahead and touch my side and see and believe. Verse 28, it doesn't say if Thomas actually did it or not, but he answered him, My Lord and my God. Thomas was left behind for one week without the experience, and then in this moment, in a matter of a few seconds, he takes a huge step forward in faith. And he calls Jesus, my Lord and my God. Now, in the Gospels, the disciples, they call Jesus these things, Lord, the Holy One of God, the Christ of God, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. But this is the first time we see a disciple making a personal statement about Jesus for who he is. My Lord and my God. Thomas, he goes even beyond maybe what the disciples have said at this point. And he believes that his master is who he has said he is. Back in early 2006, I was in a very difficult time, very difficult place. I was in another ministry and uh, I was really struggling. I was, uh, I think, a little bit depressed, I would say. I wasn't praying. I didn't have a vibrant relationship with God. And yet I still had to run this other ministry and it was very difficult. And during that time, my friend who also worked with me in this ministry, he went through a personal revival time. Susan and I, we had them, him and his wife over to our house. We were watching a movie and it was late at night. They were going to spend the night over and, uh, you know, have breakfast in the morning and then go. And uh, as we were there and uh, we were watching this movie, he gets up and he says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go uh, to uh, a room. I just need some time do you have something I can write with? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, and I was like dist- discouraged a little bit, distracted about what he was doing. And so he left and he went into my office. And so I was like, what is he doing? He didn't tell me what it was that he wanted to do. And I was just like, we're watching a movie. Like what's happening here? So I get up and I start to go towards the bathroom, but I wanted to see where he's at and what he's doing. I look in the room and he's sitting there on the ground and he's prostrate, prostrate before the Lord. And as he's there, he is uh, writing. And he's writing, and as he's writing, he's uh, saying, yeah, God was just putting something in my heart, and I needed to pen it down right there, right? This is what happens when people are revived. They start to hear from the Lord, and they're experiencing things, and he's doing that. And I just went back to the movie. I couldn't even, I don't even know what we saw. I was so discouraged because here he is on fire, and here I am not. And then that night we went to bed, and I still remember we went to sleep, and I told Susan, I said, it's so cool what's going on with my friend but I want that. I'm not in a good place right now. And she said, you know, you're going to have to get to this place. You know, I can pray for you, but there's something with you you're going to have to do. And over the next couple of weeks, God brought revival to my life through a series of events. And that was January, February of 2006. And by September of 2006, I was hired here to be the pastor of this church. See, God needed to do something in me And I couldn't live off of the revival of my friend. I needed to have my own experience with the Lord. And when we do have that experience, we can go from doubt to faith. And so you who are watching right now, who are participating in this service, what kind of things are you doubting and fearful about? What is it that's holding you back? Are you doubting because of the current circumstances, because of these difficult days? Jesus is saying the same thing he said to Thomas. He's saying it to you. Put your hands in my scars. Think for a moment and just picture Jesus dead. Picture him alive. Picture the scars that he has on his body. And all of us, we have scars, don't we? And sometimes you need a reminder of the scars and the things you've been through in the past and they'll help you in the present and they'll turn your doubt to faith. And some of you need to go back on the journey if you're in that place right now that you've been on and just get a 20,000 foot view and look down on the journey and then look for a moment and say, hey, that was a painful moment there. And just put your hand on that scar for just a moment. But don't stay there too long. Just a reminder that God was faithful. 
that God brought you through. And he can help you move from doubt to faith, from fear to peace. There is so much power in the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus gives a new faith to defeat my doubt. Don't be someone who sees the signs of God but ignores it or dismisses it. It says here, verse 29 continues, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus is talking about us also. You listening to my voice right now, if you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, you haven't seen the scars. You never put your hand in his scars. You never even saw the face of Jesus Christ, and yet you've believed. So blessed are you, loved ones, because you've believed, because you've turned, because you've embraced Jesus by faith. And so you are blessed, Jesus says it right here. It was the first group of disciples who saw the wounds and they believed. And then Thomas saw the wounds and they believed. And you, who are listening to my voice, and me, myself, we didn't see the wounds and we believed and we are blessed. Jesus blesses us. That's what he says here. There's power in the resurrection and we get some of the benefits as well. Peace to overcome my fear. Becoming a new creation to participate in Jesus' ministry. Faith to defeat my doubt. And finally, a new life to those who believe. A new life to those who believe. Verse 30, it says this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John now tells us why he wrote these things down so that you, so that you who weren't able to see it, could read it. And as you read it, that you would believe and that your belief would lead to life. Just like the breath of God gives life. These things that are written down, it's the purpose of the book. It is done so that we could have life as well. God is breathing on us right now. He's breathing on us through the word of of God. And as we receive the word of God, the breath of life gives life to us as well. And you can't live off the faith of another person. You need to make it your own. Life is short, isn't it? I worked with a man in 2005. His name was Dwight, very briefly in another ministry I was a part of. And he was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. He fought it for a few years, but even after he thought he had beat it, it came back. And I remember some of the haunting words in one of his last updates after some treatments, he wrote this. He said, I'm doing these treatments, but I'm just buying time. How many of you are just buying time? How many of you are just living your life and you're just buying time? You're just waiting and life is passing you by. Meanwhile, the breath of God is going out and as the breath of God goes out, it is bringing life into the bodies of believers. And so I want you to experience this breath, this life-giving breath that will cause you to believe, but then also have life. A lot of stories could have been written down, but these were written down, the purpose of these, so that you would believe. For several weeks, I've been giving opportunities for people to confess Jesus, and we've had, um, you know, some children confess Christ. Later, I've got some texts from people saying, yeah, my child confessed Christ at this point and different things, you know, so it's been great even during this time. We've had some people who are guests to our church watching online confess Jesus as Lord. We've had some people rededicate their lives to Christ. And so I have a question for you. Is Jesus breathing life into some of you right now? Are there any of you listening who have not experienced the power of the resurrection that I've described here from these verses? These are written so that you would believe and have life. And so if you have not yet confessed, then I want to give you an opportunity. And so even right now, just hearing my voice, if you have never confessed Christ as Lord, just say those words, 
Jesus Christ is Lord wherever you are. If it's a child in your room and they've never done it, you can ask them, hey, do you believe this? And explain to them about the gospel, about the life-giving breath that God breathes into his disciples, about how he takes us from death to life and he transforms us, that they can be a new creation. And if that's you here today who want to go from breath from death to life with the breath of God, then you can just let us know. You put a little note there. You can put it in the comments. You can text us at 77411. You could put a connect card there at the top and just let us know somehow. We're going to have a class for people that have are newer in the faith, new believers class. It's going to be coming up here in the next couple of weeks as we start to gather some of the people. And it'll be virtual. It'll be in a Zoom call or something. But we want to have more for you. We want to teach you because God wants you. God doesn't want you to waste any of these days that are going on right now in our midst. And so you could be like what it says in Luke 15, 7, that uh, there's more joy in heaven, it says, over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. And so if that's you today, just know that heaven is rejoicing in your decision. Father, I thank you for the great privilege it is to continue in the word of God and to be reminded about the power of the resurrection of Jesus our Savior. And we pray, God, that you would be with all those who have recently confessed you as Lord and all those maybe even here today that uh, have wanted to rededicate their life to you or who've confessed you for the first time, Lord, that you would be with them and be with us, that we would live lives of sacrificial obedience to you. Always, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to close with a song here. and uh, There's a line in it. It says this, Death is... Where is your sting? Your power is as dead as my sin. It's a line from this song we're going to close with, and I just want you to be encouraged that death has no more sting for the believer. If you are transformed, you have life. And so be encouraged. There's power in the resurrection of the Lord. We'll see you soon. God bless you.